Hello, Dr. Mike here. This is a topic on authentication and remote access, uh, which is topic number 11 for my new cybersecurity version 2. And it is uh, corresponding with chapter 13 of the same name of our new textbook. Um, I will say this, I'm going to briefly just talk about some of the things in the textbook and I'm going to cut to an older video uh, from the previous cybersecurity series. Uh, it's the same stuff, so not too much has changed here. I didn't want us to see, cover what's in the textbook. Um, it's a pretty good chapter, it's pretty short. I mean, really important thing is to understand authentication, authorization, accounting is very important. Um, and auditing too, which is not on this list, but auditing all this stuff is, is of importance in all kinds of aspects of cybersecurity. But uh, understand what authentication is and what authorization is, and then accounting, keeping logs or everything. So, um, Again, I'm not going to go too much into the authentication part. I talk about this stuff. I talk about MFA in the actual video, which you'll see here in a, in a couple of seconds. Um, there's some good things about remote access protocols. Of course, we know IEEE 802.1 for the RADIUS server. Um, and of course, uh, RADIUS, what it is itself, and the TACAS system, TACAS Plus. So you can see how those work. Those really work well with um, also with Wi-Fi from a lot of times, implementations. Um, Secure Shell, definitely used uh, one of the primary, primary ways to, uh, to tunnel and talk uh, to a server. So, um, VPNs, if I don't talk about it before, I think we know what VPNs are, but uh, it's important to understand what they are, but um, understand their security too. Uh, we've seen um, VPNs themselves can be attacked. So, And VPNs in the sense of um, not to cover your tracks if you're doing something bad. VPNs are very handy to have if you are pen testing. Um, I've done pen tests where I've had to run scans or do certain checks directly from my IP address here, and then also the same thing through an IP address coming out of like Amsterdam or Belgium. And um, you find actually different results based on your geographical IP. Um, I actually was able to look past some uh, web app firewall stuff because of this. So. Not because I'm doing anything sensitive. I know people talk about VPNs and they don't want their logs, their activity logged, and that, that definitely makes sense for your privacy. But um, when you think of VPNs, at least in the corporate sense, it should definitely protect this channel right here. So talking back to the home to home network or VPN is critical. And a lot of large companies actually stamp, stamp their own virtual private network VPN um, services. And so that's definitely a networking aspect to look at but uh, they are fantastic to use. So, um, and really the transport mode, IPsec, our layer three, um, and IPv6 is gonna offer more security here too, so. Uh, and that's really what the chapter talks about. Again, I've glossed over some of the stuff here with MFA, uh, because you will see that here um, in a video by the same name, really, <laughs> the same topic from the previous series. So here comes that video, thanks. So authentication and account management. Authentication, definitely something that we've all ran into even before you even started college. Um, it's the normal ID password, right? Uh, with, let's put ID and our password. So this is basically what we refer to as we have multi-factor authentication. This is first factor. Uh, first being something you know. Now, of course, we know the ID. Uh, this is some form of a unique identifier, an email address, a user ID. It could be other things too, though, but um, we'll just username is, we'll take that as our most common one. And username and password is definitely the most common and also it could be the most troublesome for security. Um, and for a lot of reasons, we'll see why. So, something you know is our first factor. Now, we can add to that. And we can see something you have, and this is called second factor. So ID, password, and then something we have. It could be a, a, mobile, a, a key fob, a mobile device. So it could be a mobile phone number or an email that we receive. Um, of course, SMS, code, or a code over email, some sort of code, right? And we see this with um, uh, with a lot of the app applications. We'll send you over text um, that are even like right now 
uh, Star Wars Old Republic game. There's actually an app on my mobile device that will give me a code. So this code is our second factor. It's sort of a way to verify that second factor is what it is. So again, the code itself um, is just a way to verify that we are who we say we are based on this second factor of something we have. So again, something we have, something we know, first factor, something we have, second factor. There is a third factor here we can do, and that is something you are. And this, of course, would be a fingerprint, um, fingerprint recognition, facial recognition, um, biometrics, referred to as a third factor. So if anything, you'll see, and we're gonna see in a lot of places, second factor authentication. Uh, it used to include called MFA, multi-factor authentication, which usually refers to this. And this is the most common, and definitely a plus. There's a lot of pluses to this. Um, there is some administrative side, of course, you need to install an app. If the phone gets lost, I don't have the app. And yeah, there's ways to recover that app or uh, set up a new device in my account without having a device. And that's going to go back to some sort of customer support, which yes, can be hackable, right? Uh, if I can tell someone I am who I say I am and I have a new phone number, um, somehow prove that maybe with a credit card information or information uh, gleaned from uh, passive reconnaissance, uh, social media. Uh, so yeah, it is not foolproof, but uh, it's going to help us with this right here, this password issue. Uh, now this with third factor brings in, it brings in some ease of use. So I can have a strong passphrase on this device, but the typing each time is cumbersome. And um, most people don't want to like, you know, don't like the idea of a cumbersome every single time I open this device up. So the fingerprint authentication, you know, boom, it opens it up, I'm in. Uh, and that's good. That's going to make the first factor stronger in a lot of ways. So I can have a stronger passcode by making it ease of use with the third factor. Now there is a fourth factor here. I don't know if they bring it up here on, on credentials. Um, there's a fourth factor, uh, and it is sort of where you are. And we've talked about this before, uh, geometric IP gating, um, you know, an example of this is uh, password management. So there, I know like LastPass has a feature where they don't allow access from an IP range um, within like Ukraine or in China or you know areas are known to be um, hives of either hackers or hackers using VPNs to these um, these IP ranges. So geographical, uh, maybe using GPS, uh, some sort of geographic fencing it's called. Uh, another example is maybe I have an app I open up that does not allow access unless I am on a certain Wi-Fi network. Um, and that Wi-Fi network being maybe uh, an organization or an institution. So there's a way to bring that in. Uh, so those are the different factors to look at. And let's talk about the reason why we have those factors, and that's because of passwords. It is the most common authentication today, and it also is the most attackable and usually the weakest because of us, uh, humans. So uh, passwords are the weak links. And long, complex passwords are definitely the way to go. Uh, no surprise, um, a long password, a random password, it's going to be harder to crack. And I say crack, we'll look at that in a second here. Um, and really think about it. Uh, it's called entropy. It's actually a physics, um, thermodynamics, I believe, which is the degree of randomness. Um, and you want that in your pass code, pass phrase, password. Um, and length itself actually does link to it. Now, I can make a password one, two, three with dot, 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 you know, period, 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 or one, two, three, 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 three. That is gonna be better than one, two, three. It is longer, um, but it still has limited scope. And I say by that is this. Um, so let's look at our what we can bring in to bear our passwords. We have a, a lowercase a through z, right? We have 28 characters here, alphabet. As soon as I bring in uppercase, I now have another option of, it's supposed to be a Z, <laughs> another 28. So I just doubled my entropy pool. I say entropy pool again, it's because we need to guess. What do we need to guess? Um, 
talked about this before in previous chapter about, of course, your example, zero through nine. Um, if my passcode on my phone is only zero through nine, well, that's, um, you know, we have 10 things we need to guess. So it's a small pool. Um, so example for a mobile device, if I have a passcode, I don't know if they changed it or not, it's been a while. My mind, I've used a longer passcode for a long time, but it used to be on the, like the iPhone screen, it shows a keypad with four dots. Well, right away it tells me that it's four digits and I know it's four zero through nine. So it literally has just set my scope of my attack. Whereas if I add in uh, a lowercase a to that, now it becomes a pass phrase. And my screen just shows a big text box and a keyboard. And now as an attacker trying to get into this device physically, I have no idea now. Does it, is it uppercase, lowercase? I know that it's no longer zero through nine. It's something else. So um, expanding that, it's bugging me. I have a better Z there. Um, expanding this pool of entries is going to help out. Now our special characters, well, let's add space. If you, if you allow spaces, this the old space bar here, right? That, of course, adds one more. Um, and it depends on how you handle passphrases, and it should be handled securely, it should allow spaces. And then we have special characters, right? We have, of course, the dollar signs, uh, pound signs, um, percentage signs, you know, the at symbol, these special characters. And I believe those in my notes here, how we have 32 of these possible. So that's a 99 pool of randomness. So which is going to make this go from, let's use our one through, you know, our one through zero. You know, we literally have gone from 10 to 99. So we've increased this randomness. And you can test for this. And this is an example. This is from GRC, Gibson Research Corporation, a uh, great resource. And you can test out a password. Um, password, I can see it's space, it's depth, it's, you know, 26 characters, 26, and we have eight characters here, and possible online or offline attack, and of course, password known being really bad. If I do password one, now it's actually dumped it. Now still, uh, we look at password attacks are different. We're gonna bring this out of the bear, but just the fact that we've increased the depth of this. Uh, if I put in a pound sign, it's made it larger. I make this uppercase P, um, now we're in weeks. And still, this is not a good password. Uh, it does bring an uppercase, lowercase, a digit, and a symbol, which increases our, our space. So call, in this case, they call it the search space analysis. I call it entropy. Um, and it is, it's pretty obvious. It's common sense. It's, it's hard to, to guess. Now, again, if I add a dot, a dot, two dots of that, because I've increased the depth, uh, in this case, 95, it's going to now, it does the thousands of centuries, whatever. Uh, and, and these are just sort of rough calculations. Um, but the important thing is, even if it just contains the word password, which we know is not a good password, but by adding this and this uppercase, I've made it a harder to guess in certain attack scenarios. So the idea is don't, be, don't become the low-hanging fruit. Uh, and usually what will happen is you have a data breach. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go over a good password. Um, strategy here. One, of course, being different passwords to different sites. Uh, second is a strong password. So I have, let's say I'm a part of a gaming site, and this is my password for that gaming site. And that, of course, that site has bad security. It's breached. Uh, passwords are held. Uh, maybe just the hashes. Whatever the case, the password gets out. Right away, I'll change it. But second, um, if it's, let's say they're held semi-securely, but they can go through and try to hash, you know, break, break the hashes with some sort of offline attack. Um, as an attacker, uh, if it takes, you know, if it takes, you know, let's just one point seven four centuries, let's say, so let's say, you know, that's probably a little unrealistic, but let's say it takes months of processing time to break my password. I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna move on to the next one, find that low hanging fruit. Um, but it's only use those for other attacks. So, so again, um, they should be unique for each site. Um, you know, they, sh you know. And it should be some sort of password policy in place. This goes back again to um, uh, administrative and security policies, written policies, training, and verification. So we should, of course, you know, enforce passwords if possible. And that's an that's a technical aspect. Of course, on the server itself or my device, I set up a, a policy. 
Active Directory policy, we need to have a password that's you know over eight characters, twelve characters, one uppercase, one lowercase, one you know one digit. Um, so we can enforce that, and we can have a written policy to sort of back it up. They say don't use the same password in multiple places. So you can see that you know you need to have written and technical place uh, technical uh, ways to go ahead and enforce good passwords. Um, weak passwords is that I don't think we already we know we take shortcuts. There's the hacker, you know replacing in certain things um, like replacing L instead of lead one and replace C3 T you know there's that hacker speak things like that um, but unfortunately um, this stuff's already been known there's dictionaries that have these already pre-made and we'll talk about the attacks here in a second so again here's an example the rank of passwords so I can get those passwords social engineering is probably the first one um, there is, let me look at my notes here, I have, I've used myself, uh, cup, which is a password, my notes here, my old RTFM manual, uh, cup, um, is a password, this is a Python script, C-U-P-P, -P. I should have brought it up for this lecture, <clears throat> so if I'm doing a pen test, I'm going to look at all my targets and I maybe I'll focus my targets into specific people maybe uh, marketing managers maybe accounting managers and again not not trying to stereotype anybody but people I don't think are gonna have the forefront of uh, keeping security in mind and being a marketing person they go they want to be on social media they want to you know meet people people like to know about them well shoot I can figure out where they went to college their spouse's first name their pets name uh, their favorite movie, their favorite book. I feed this into, I think it was cup, feed it into cup, and it'll come up with a dictionary of possible passwords. So, um, information about, a, you know, this is the, this is the uh, social engineering aspect. This is the, sort of the pseudo virtual dumpster diving, um, which I can create a phishing attack maybe, get some attention and capture them over a key logger. So again, there's other vectors that can be used to get those passwords. And the reset attack, this is a good one. Uh, when evaluating your password um, strengths for your, your institution or your company, or you're being paid as a pen tester, maybe, or you're doing an evaluation as a security consultant, look at how they reset passwords. Um, that uses the weak link. I, you have a great, maybe you have a really good way of sort of securing the passwords correctly, and we'll talk about that in a second. You follow the best practice for securing them. However, your password reset policy is, you know, guess these three questions. And this has been shown in the past. Um, the governor of Alaska, I think it was Sarah Palin, her Yahoo account was uh, attacked. You think it was a sophisticated attack? Did they come in using some sort of NCIS looking screens? No, no. They basically looked at the wiki page for the person and found out, uh, I think it was their anniversary or their uh, anniversary date. And that was one of the, that was the research, the password reset question. What is, which is a weak reset, so. Um, and even then, uh, password login pages. Um, if I go to a, a password login page, I go to a, a login page, I put in a username Mike, and I put in password test, and I hit go, and I know it's wrong. Um, and so again, approach this from the attacker's point of view. And it comes back and says, I'm sorry, um, that password's incorrect. Okay, I put in, maybe I put in Dr. Mike and test, Comes back and says, I'm sorry, that username and password are incorrect. You see what I'm doing here? I literally can leverage your site uh, or our own site to figure out a list of usernames. And there are username lists out there. I have a bunch of them on my laptop here. Uh, I'll just feed through and find the ones that come back and say the password is incorrect, but then they say the username is incorrect. Use like Burp Suite, I can automate the attack, feed that to a CSV file. I have a list of now usernames. Uh, so it's those little things like that. That could slip by. That's part of the resetting attack. So, so attacks. Most attacks are going to happen offline, though you can do these attacks directly with a website. Uh, will be an online attack. Offline attack would be if uh, somehow I get a database of passwords, maybe through a SQL injection, and I can crack them. You want to crack those offline. It's you can bring more power to bear um, using GPUs and Hashcat, for example, and that's using a rainbow table attack. Um, you can try to uh, basically create those, get those passwords, and then you have username and passwords. And then, of course, the idea being 
Um, if someone's username is their email, is that same password used for their email account? Again, back to password, uh, you know, proper password um, security, which is don't use the same password in the same place. So, again, offline attack probably the most powerful. Um, offline attack also we can do different things. And an online attack, uh, let's talk about two things here: brute force and dictionary. This is something that gets confused a lot. I run this in a lot of my classes, and right away, brute force. Oh, it's brute force. Well. Brute force actually is algorithmic. It's actually using this. It's saying, uh, hit this 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 you know this website. Hit, hit username. I know the username Mike works because I used that attack. You know that attack method before. And for the password, I want you to go ahead and do uppercase lowercase a through z, and then uh, uppercase a through z, and then zero through nine, and start with a a b b. Now, this is an algorithmic attack. This is called a brute force attack. And it is usually not the best attack to, to approach. Now, let's say, example, I know they use a passcode, maybe some social engineering, and I know it's only this. Well, then, yeah, go ahead and try it. You know, 000 through 999, and all combinations in between. You see, these are very lengthy attacks, uh, very noisy, um, but this is an algorithmic attack. So that's brute force. Brute force referring to brute force different patterns. And now a dictionary attack sounds the same way you think. Well, dictionary is using brute force. Well, it's forcing different things into this field, but it's getting it from a file of passwords. And it can be the usually in like mine I have the five like the first top five hundred bad worst passwords. You know, password, password one. One, two, three, four, and so on. And then maybe I have some custom ones I put in, I append to this file, create my own dictionary. This is a dictionary attack. And by the way, um, let's see, I sure had it open for this, but um, weak pass, for example. Not to advertise the site, but I can go here and download. Uh, here's all my brute force. You know, it's got two, it says. Um, I can find word lists easily. Weak pass 2A. And these are, these are pretty big. 80, 84 gigabytes. Here's an example. That's a big dictionary, 80, 85 gigs. Um, but yeah, I, if I want to copy these and put them into a dictionary, just do that. So, um, week pass, for example, I can go find these. I can find previous password dictionaries from like LinkedIn attacks. Um, they're out there, and I'll use these in my dictionary. And then the best thing is if I can do some sort of uh, reconnaissance work. And figure out maybe how the password is being used, especially for this user. I can customize using like cup my dictionary. So, but uh, dictionary attack and brute force attack are, are different. Uh, let's keep that in mind. You know that the idea of brute force being we're forcing ourselves in is sort of used with both. So to keep that in mind, if you go for a certain exam, so. A hash manager can help hash passwords, every combination of letters, numbers, and characters. That's a brute force attack. It's very slow. Uh, masking attack, rule attacks, and so on. Um, understand that different attacks can happen again against your site. And this will uh, help you defend against it. So here's again, uh, with some analysis, you can figure out um, mask attacks here, rule attacks, statistical analysis, and so on. Dictionary attack again. Pretty straightforward. I already talked about this. Um, the birthday attack being there's two digests of the same. Uh, this is where rainbow tables sort of come in. It's pre-generated uh, sets of candidate digests you can use. Uh, usually very effective. Uh, you can feed it plain text passwords. You can create the table, get initial passwords. Um, Hashcat is great at this, and uh, it's definitely one of the main tools they use for attacks. John, John the Ripper. Hydra, we'll use those two. And so rainbow tables, definitely look at this. And password collections. Again, there's a lot of them out there. I showed you one already. Uh, Usually through SQL ejection attacks. And the idea being is this, that you know, it's hard now to have a unique password. Uh, it's just, it's, someone's probably used something close to it. Or maybe even the exact one. Even if you roll your face across the keyboard, someone may have used that password. But the fact that you have something that is unique, it makes you harder to crack and versus someone who has the word password1234 in their uh, 
in the Azure password. It's easier to go back and crack through several methods. So password security. Again, password managers are great. Uh, protecting the passwords is, is very important. How passwords are um, stored is utmost importance. I talked about this already. It's authentications. Uh, using tokens, which is again MFA, access cards, and cell phones. So, so again, biometrics. I think I've got ahead of myself here. Uh, there are behavioral biometrics. I haven't seen this used too much. I think the problem is with um, any false positives, you can have, end up having more issues and more support issues that you do security. And geolocation, talk about that. So, uh, we'll move on to this last part here. Let's talk about, again, what can I use to find best ways to do certain things? Um, NIST, again, being a great one. Search for passwords, NIST, SANS. I'm going to point out, though, OWASP, one of my favorite sites to use. They have these called cheat sheets. And put yourself in the position of being a, you know, your brand new uh, you know, uh, security engineer. And you're given, you're asked by a development team, okay, what's the best way we should store our passwords? You know, we don't know. We're, we're, we're a database. I'm a DBA. I don't know. I, my, I know what encryption is, but what's, what should I use? What's the best way? You don't have to get not to come up with this new. There are some good cheat sheets you can sort of give to or talk through um, a, you know, a DBA or a developer. Tell them what algorithms they use. Tell them you know, where to use, where to look. The FIPS, one, you know, FIPS 142, PCI DSS. So if you have to apply to regulatory, definitely use their guidelines. Uh, how cipher modes, random ge number generations use, very important randomness. Um, you know, don't use this any kind of you know random function, uh, and so on. So this goes through in depth. You can sort of t pick from this and uh, look at Azure Key Vault, Amazon KMS. So again, there's ways to sort of make sure you're using the proper technique. If you're using cloud, make sure you look at the Amazon's key management service for the cloud, Azure, for example. And so, and password authentication itself. How do we do passwords? Input validation cheat sheet for email discussion here. So, uh, what is this? Input validation. Uh, whitelisting and blacklisting. So we know about that. That actually goes to a separate topic. But we go through and how do we properly Ask for password. There's a NIST link here. Uh, we should have a minimum length. We should have a, you know, do we have a maximum length? If we do, is it set too low? Um, I usually don't you know, see why you need a maximum length, but how we store it, how we implement a recovery mechanism, and hey, again, here we go. Um, what's the best way to do a password recovery? Yeah, and you find that they have the three questions. What's the three security questions? Um, what's the best way to do this? Forget password services and so on. So again, I'm not going to talk the oldest, but this stuff's out there, and you can see what's the best uh, way to do specific things. And the idea is too is if they're a Java developer, there's best known libraries to use to do this encryption, and if you're a database, best ways to, to store that encryption. Um, these exist for all platforms, so use those. Uh, if you're going to use in cloud, use what the cloud recommends, uh, separation of keys and data, and, and how to encrypt and stored keys. So, again, there's great stuff for these cheat sheets, and there's a lot of them. Here, look at this. Um, tons of cheat sheets here. I can't recommend this enough. Just do a Google OWASP cheat sheet series, and, you know, forgot password, there it is, file upload. There's a ton of stuff here. So you'll see me use this a lot in, in the face-to-face -face lectures or just reference. Um, so again, you're not left holding the bag. You don't have to come up with a how to do, how, to, you know, how do we store passwords for our databases? You can definitely leverage OWASP as a starting point. Uh, if it's Microsoft database, we'll go to Microsoft, look for their best practices. And really, uh, you know, you don't have to, don't think of something new, don't create your own encryption. Use best practices. Use use uh, well proven, uh, NIST approved encryption. So, um, single sign is great. This is going to bring some easy use. Uh, example: If you sign into your college uh, main portal and you click on like eLearn in our case, our shell, and it brings you and logs you in directly. 
Um, just make sure though there how this is done. Single sign-on does has some stuff. It reduces the you know need of a different username password for different systems, which is great because if you force too many different passwords on their end users, whether internal or external, they're gonna end up having easy passwords because it just I need to have four passwords for this college, uh, let's say or this institution. Uh, I'm gonna create an easy one for sing for you know the shell, an easy one for my for my my own account access. It just you make it easier by having one single strong password and using single sign-on, OAuth, things like that. But these do have ways, so be, be aware if they're in place, OAuth, uh, it's audited and it is uh, set up and configured correctly. So uh, Active Directory being a huge one, that's definitely the one place you'll see for Microsoft. Uh, use those. Um, if you have a policy in place that says you need to have a strong password, make sure Active Directory has policies that enforce that. So uh, authentication, you can probably guess password is a big, big part of this, this topic. Um, just realize there are some uh, other ways you can use uh, sign-on, which single sign-on, and uh, understand managing passwords and uh, how to best manage those when with a password manager either given to by the by your, your institution or your, your own personal use. So I think I covered most of the chapter. Uh, that is chapter 11. That's authentication and account management. Hope this is helpful. Thank you.